my attorney, my accountant, everybody, Brandon filed BK, just filed BK and I didn't do it. Had a month where I made 25 grand on the Huracan. The exotics are more out like an elephant of, hey, this elephant could sit on me or it could really gain me some serious traction. I haven't made anything this month or last month mm. from somebody who damaged it. You don't just go from mm. five cars to 150, like everything changes as mm. volumes go up. You know, there's some cars you're gonna get where you think, oh, this is gonna crush and it doesn't. You know, I bought a brand new Lotus and it broke a windshield. They're four grand. There's nobody here that services Lotuses. Mm. I bribed my mom, I wrote her a little note. Really, I was trying to sell her, right? <laughs> and getting me a Lego set. I said, I'm gonna have a, a red Ferrari by the time I'm 30. And I remember getting that red Ferrari and sending her that picture and then remembering that note. Welcome back to another episode of the Austin Zayback Show. Today, we have a very good friend of mine named Brandon Bartrone. And uh, Brandon is uh, just an incredible human being. You're gonna learn that more in a little while. Uh, Brandon actually owns the second largest Turo operation in the nation. Yeah. Uh, over 150 cars in your Turo operation. And we actually did a Turo business tour on a different YouTube channel, which we'll link to that down below. So if you're watching uh, the video right now, and throughout the video, you're more interested in how he built that massive tarot operation. Definitely go watch that other video, but I'm sure we'll talk about it uh, more in depth in the video we're about to film now. You've also built um, and mastered you know, door-to-door -door sales. You built a security company yeah. um, called America Security. Hopefully, I'm allowed to say that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, obviously, the tarot company is called America Motors. Yeah. Uh, America's Motors. Yeah. And, um, man, I know you've done a lot of other cool stuff. You're highly connected. I'm excited to dive into how you built the security company, how you built the tarot company, um, and just how you built your life and and who you are today. And I appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here. I'm a huge fan of yours. I I watch your show. I love your show. I got about a 35, 40 minute drive to work every day. And so I get in just podcast to and from work and you're the show I'm listening to right now. So Man. Uh, privilege for me to be here. Thank you. I love that, dude. That That's awesome. Yeah, I think you were telling me the other day you were listening to the Andy Elliott one. Yeah. And uh, he's a good dude. I love that guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We posted a, like a short form on IG. It's already at like 3 million views. I mean, it's just like, yeah. you know. Just yeah. great energy, uh, good heart, passionate. Uh, just, I'm like you. I love people like that. Yeah. And yeah, so it was fun to watch his. I actually listened to that three times. Wow. Just so you know. Yeah. Dude. It's that good. I've listened to it twice, so you've got me beat. That's good. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of good little nuggets in there. Really? I got to go back and listen yep. to it again, man. I'll tell you what. Well, I really appreciate the support, dude. And uh, yeah, man, I'm really grateful that you're here. You know, I'm grateful that we get to share with everybody um, knowledge, you know, and yeah. wisdom. And I think yeah. that, um, you know, you've, you've done a lot of things that we'll talk about over the next, you know, hour um, that, you know, maybe somebody watching or listening can get value from. And, um, and I'm just excited for that. So, um, you know, before we kind of dive into, you know, how you got to where you're at and on the tarot, you know, platform, which by the way is, is, you know, incredibly awesome. Um, and before we get into all of that, you know, I want to just talk about like where you came from. So like, where'd you come from? I know you were talking a little while ago. I actually didn't know until today you're from Hawaii. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you were born in Hawaii. Well, I wasn't born in okay. Hawaii, but I spent my entire childhood in Hawaii all the way through high school. So Pretty much my entire adolescent life was spent in Hawaii. And it wasn't until I graduated high school that I moved to the mainland. We called mm. it the mainland. The <laughs> mainland. What uh, what island? Uh, Oahu. North Oahu. shore of Oahu. Uh, most famous for the Polynesian Cultural Center. Mm. That's the uh, big thing in our town. Yeah. Oahu, that's not... I, I don't know much about Hawaii. I've only been there one time. Um, I've been to the the one the touristy one with the Ritz Carlton and everything. Yeah, is that Oahu? So that's actually Oahu. Okay, uh, but the south side of the island, uh, Honolulu, mm. which you know, if you're going to go to Hawaii, go to a tropical part of Hawaii, not the tenth largest city in the country, Honolulu. Yeah. So uh, a lot of fun places in Hawaii. So I'll give you some good pointers next mm. uh, trip. I would love that. Yeah, because yeah, I went to Honolulu. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, but we it'll did get better from there, dude. <laughs> I I tore out a car. Okay. In Hawaii, nice. Many years ago, me and my one of my buddies actually, me and him went um, just to go, you know, explore or whatever. And uh, I tarot a little um, stick shift like Volkswagen, and we drove to the other side of the island. We drove all the way around yeah. the entire island. Yeah, yeah. yeah. beautiful, you can beautiful. In a couple beautiful. hours. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. but, but it, it was a great childhood in Hawaii. Hawaii is uh, 
there's so much beauty in the Polynesian culture. There's a huge melting pot of people in Hawaii, just within the Polynesian community. There's mm -hmm. Tongans, Samoans, Hawaiians, and man, some of the biggest hearted people mm -hmm. you'll, you'll ever meet. And uh, so I really enjoyed my time growing up in Hawaii. And uh, even though I was uh, the only white guy on a football team of 120 people, Holy some people God. had the same numbers. That's how many people were on our team. <laughs> and I was the only white guy, but they didn't make me feel like that. And uh, it, it was a great time growing yeah. up in Hawaii. I love that. You did, what, like, I feel like you're really laid back. Like, you're, you ever, ever, like, you know, since the day that I called you, I remember the day that I called you out, out of the blue. And uh, every time that we've ever had the opportunity to hang out and we've, you know, developed our friendship and our relationship, like, you're really chill, you're laid back. And I yeah. admire that about you. Yeah. Is that something that you learned, like, that you got from yeah. growing up in Hawaii? No, I, when you have kids. <laughs> 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 Once you have kids, uh, you'll know. But no, I think uh, Ed Milet says this best. He has a word called equanimity, mm. which is calmness under duress. And ever since he said that, it's one of those things on a podcast where I'll stop it. Mm. Oh, that was good. And I'll push that 15 second rewind button over and over and over again until I have it memorized. And that was one of the earlier podcasts I listened to him. And I said, you know what? I really don't have that much patience. Mm. And so I think about that word every single time I'm in that position of getting frustrated or too heated in the moment of just being calm. Mm. So it's definitely a skill that uh, I wasn't born with that I still slip at times that has to be, has to be mastered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I love yeah. that, yeah. you know, and, um, and I respect that because it, it is not an easy thing to do, you know, uh, especially when you're building a company or you're an entrepreneur, you're failing on, on a regular basis and you are, um, you pouring into people, P you know, people mm -hmm. can be tough at times, mm -hmm. right. And they can challenge you. And uh, having patience and and truly loving and pouring into people from just a pure place of just love is it can be a difficult thing. Yeah. So yeah. Well, I think a lot of times we're tempted to judge people from where we're at, mm -hmm. instead of understanding that they come from a different background, they're at a different stage in their life, they've had different experiences than you've had in your life. And I think when you can kind of humble yourself to say, okay, this person's in a different quadrant than I'm in right now. And if I'm going to serve them, I have to kind of understand that mm. in order to bring them back up. I love that. So. Yeah, you know, I listened to, uh, I can't remember what it was. Uh, you know what it was? It was Landmark, where I, maybe we were even talking about it, but it was like, you know, it's nearly impossible to completely put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Like, we think that we can do that, right? Like, they're, you know, the old saying, right? Just put yourself in their shoes, right? But when you practically think about doing that, it's like you would have to have gone through everything that they went through yeah. their entire life yeah. and know every minute, de like every detail, right? Yeah. In order to truly be able to see the world the way that they see the world, right? Yeah. And, and so therefore, like, we can't judge people really at all, like if you think about it, right? Like we're, we live in a society that's so quick to judge, right? And I think that we're wrong in doing that, like almost 100%, if not 100% of the time, right? Because even the people that do things that we don't agree with at all, it's like, yeah, but like, you don't know what it's like to be them. Like, you don't know why they did that. I'm not saying that maybe they did something wrong and it was a terrible thing. Maybe it was, but it doesn't mean that in their mind, they didn't have some crazy reason in doing that, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. pretty wild. Yeah. Where, I mean, it was about 2003 for me when I graduated high school. And I don't know if you had delusions of grandeur when you were in high school, but <laughs> I, I was that guy in high school thinking, okay, I'm good in football. I've got good grades. I work really hard. I'm a good hearted guy. I'm just going to have that house on the hill and that red Ferrari. <laughs> and then of course you graduate and literally within yeah. months, I'm sleeping in the back of my mom's car at, uh, I think it was LA fitness. This was in Orem, Utah. There was a, it's a different name for it. It's a big, big gym. And then life hits you and you go, Oh wow. You know, this isn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. And, you know, for me, I spent a good couple of months having a pity party of, you know, pointing fingers at people and woe is me and this and that. And somebody introduced me to something. And I don't know if you've seen it yourself, but it's called the secret. 
Oh yeah, a million times. And I watched that show and it immediately shifted my perspective. I immediately started getting really conscious about what I was thinking about and not blaming people, but taking control of my own situation and not being a victim of my environment. And so for me, Hey, real quick, I just want you to do me a huge favor. If you're enjoying the show and you're enjoying all the amazing guests that we've been having on lately, then do me a massive favor and smash the like button, drop a comment down below and subscribe if you have not already. I would greatly appreciate it. It would mean the world to me and we will be able to bring on a lot more big names if you help us out. Now let's get back to the show. In 2003, that's where my journey really began. That's where I started taking ownership of who I was. And, and you know, if I did want to have that house on the hill and drive that red Ferrari, then, you know, I need to focus on me. And per so that's where my story of personal development came from. I'll be honest with you, before that, I don't even think I, if you were to said, hey, well, how's your personal development? I'd go, what is that? <laughs> uh, like eating more ice cream or less ice cream? Or like, what do you mean personal? Like, I didn't really have consciousness mm -hmm. of it. So... You know, whether you want to, be, I know you have a lot of people who love entrepreneurialism on this podcast. I'm a hardcore entrepreneur, or if you just want to be better, you want to improve your family life, you want to make more money, you want to just feel a better sense of well being, like personal development is where you have to start. Mm -hmm. It's not something I think you master. I think it's something that every day you have to figure out how you can get better. Mm -hmm. And I learned that by being in the back of my mom's car at a gym. Wow that uh, something had to change. So I'm, I know you have a very similar story, which I love about uh, your grandparents' garage mm -hmm. and being in there. And uh, I think it's from those experiences that we get a really deep perspective on where people come from mm -hmm. and respecting that. I, I see people, oh man, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I'm noticing a lot. I was at the DMV mm -hmm. this morning. Oh, wow. And this guy is yelling with this poor girl at the DMV because she's not doing what she, he wants him to do. And in my, there's so many things going through my head when I see this because me and you both know that mm. conflict is really just miscommunication, mis, misalignment, uh, misunderstanding. And I'm like, man, you know what? That was probably me a couple years ago or mm. 10 years ago or five years ago. And it doesn't solve anything. Mm -hmm. It just amplifies your problem. And so I, I would encourage anybody here who wants to get better to say, hey, look, it's not the circumstance that you're in. It's not the way you were raised. It's not like quit being a victim of your environment. Take control of your own life and say, today is day one. I'm going to focus on me and getting better at what I do. I love that, dude. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and now uh, you have uh, you said that you're when you're on when you're in high school you it was just like big house on a hill and a red Ferrari and now you have a yellow Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever get a red one? I actually did. So okay, <laughs> I uh, uh, when I was thirty, it's so when I grew up, I bribed my mom for a Lego set. Mm. Uh, I loved Legos when I was little because I'm a builder. I just love to build things. My wife makes fun of me now because I still have Legos mm -hmm. of cars and stuff like that, and. Uh, I bribed my mom. I wrote her a little note and I said, I'm going to run for president when I get older. And yeah. I, really, I was trying to sell her, right? I'm <laughs> getting me a Lego set. And I said, I'm going to have a, a red Ferrari by the time I'm 30. And I remember getting that red Ferrari and sending her that picture and then remembering that note mm -hmm. that I had written. And so there's another really powerful thing for people that are listening to this is uh, I heard on another podcast the other day that thoughts are the currency at which you buy your dreams. Wow. And a lot of us right now, we're mm. thinking about the things we don't have. We're thinking about the things we don't like. Mm -hmm. We're thinking about the people who agitate us. We're thinking about bad scenarios and we're wondering why we're attracting all these bad things in mm -hmm. our life. So the quality of your thoughts controls the quality of your life. Mm. And uh, when you start to, going back to what you talked about earlier about being calm, I think when you get older and you go through all these scenarios and you've fallen down as many times as I've fallen down in every aspect of my life, you start to realize that this is just, this is a part of our experience mm -hmm. and you can make it worse mm -hmm. or you can say, what am I supposed to learn here? How am I supposed to grow from this mm -hmm. and move forward? So I just choose to move forward. Now I have my moments sure, and uh, I think we all do, but uh, I try to have the most amount of equanimity, 
calmness under duress that I can. I love that. Yeah. yeah, I really do. I really admire that. I really admire the personal development. I think everybody watching, you know, somebody might be watching because we're about to talk about Turo or your security company or whatever, but really the way that you build anything great like any of that, right, is by having a phenomenal mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And by being a good human being and like, you know, um, I read a quote, it was like, you know, it's every man's responsibility to put back into the world a minimum or the equivalent of what he took out of it, you know? And I was like, that kind of resonated with me, right? Like we've got to like sew back into the world. Like we got to give, like we, what was the quote that you told me a minute yeah. ago? Yeah. So I actually had this on my email stamp mm -hmm. for many years cause I loved it so much, but it goes success is getting what you want. Mm -hmm. Fulfillment is giving what you have. And mm -hmm. I have had many scenarios in my life where I, I mean, I get texts every day cause I'm on group threads with mm -hmm. companies that I own of somebody buying their first brand new car off the lot or something like that. And I honestly get more joy out of that mm -hmm. than I do me getting a brand new car right mm -hmm. off of the lot. So it, my biggest misconception, I think in my twenties was make a bunch of money and you're going to be happy. Mm. You know, and I grew up poor, so a lot of it was deep rooted in that. You know, mm -hmm. like that's that's how to solve your problems, right? Is right. to just have money. And uh, thankfully, God gave me the gift of making me poor when I grew up, mm. giving me a ton of money in my twenties, taking it all away from me in my early thirties, mm. and then giving it back to me because I deserved it. So there's something so special about going through life and just realize like we want to get so wrapped up in the moment, right. Of like, like so emotional about this person doing that to me or this person taking this from me. And you really just rob your own joy mm -hmm. by doing that. It's like that Buddha quote, right. Yeah. You know, drinking poison, hoping, uh, you know, Oh gosh, I forgot how it goes, but yeah, I, I know which one you're talking about, yeah. but it's been a while since yeah. I've heard that Hating one. somebody yeah. is drinking poison, hoping, hoping they'll they die. die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you're the one drinking the poison. Right. So, yeah. 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 Pretty, pretty cool what you said there. You know, you said that, like, and I can't remember exactly how you worded it, but, like, one of the greatest gifts that God gave you was the fact that you had it all. Well, you went from nothing to having it all to losing it all to then getting it all back when you deserved it, right? And you call that a gift now looking back at it in hindsight's obviously 2020, right? But like I, I've thought a lot about that in my life, right? You know, I've I've I feel like I've been on that roller coaster probably two or three times now. And believe it or not, even at my age, because I've owned I've I've started like 10 different companies and um six or seven of them haven't worked out, you know. So um and the, the four or five that I own right now are are doing phenomenal, right? But a lot of, the, there was multiple times in there where like I thought I was like doing great and life was good, right? And then it got taken away from me like multiple times. And I'm like, what the heck, you know? Um, and now I feel very similarly to how you feel, right? Which is like, man, like I feel like I am just a different human being now. Like I'm not, you know, like I, I had a guy on my team that went and bought a Tesla, right? Like the other day. And, um, he, dude, he's like, how old's Murphy, Jacob? Do you know how old Murphy is? Like 19? Love 19 it. years old, right? He started with me when he was 17, and he's 19. So he, he couldn't even, we had to convince his parents when he started with me to let him do real estate deals like under an LLC that they created, <laughs> right? And um, now he runs an entire department in our team, within our team. And, you know, and when he was like going to buy the Tesla, dude, I was like jacked out of my mind, right? I was like, it's so cool. So it's cool to hear you say that. How do, for somebody watching or listening, right? Like how do they, how do you, in because I ask everybody this that when we get on the conversation, right? Like how can you in the moment though? Because a lot of times like it's easy, people watching might be like, well, it's easy for you to say, Brandon, like now you, you had it, you lost it. Now you have it back again, like, and then they're like in the valley though right now, right? Like, or they're, they're in the middle of the struggle or the grind or whatever like that season of life is like right now, right? Like how do you get through that valley or get to the other side quicker 
or like learn whatever lesson that you are meant to learn faster or be more appreciative in the moment so you don't have to wait five or seven or 10 years to look back and be grateful for it. Like, is there a way to do that, do you yeah. think? Um, it again goes back to personal development. Try and have a mentor to like tell you what's really going on versus how you feel things are happening. Cause a lot of times that's a lie. Uh, and the other, I would say is just be present with yourself, like be honest with yourself. And I, I'm a big fan of God is going to give you a hurdle over and over again until you figure out how to jump over it. And you can run over it a hundred. Some people do. They'll go their entire life making the same mistakes over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. But that is in and of itself the definition of insanity, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want peace and if you want bliss in your life, like you have to take the lessons as they come to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think people have this perspective of, you know, if it, if it doesn't give me that instant gratificational hit or that dopamine hit, then I don't want anything to do with it. And they just lose sight of the fact that for, for me, happiness for me comes down to progress. Mm. Am I making progress mm -hmm. in each area of my life? Am I becoming a better father? Am I becoming a better uh, entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. right? Am I becoming a better friend? And if the, the days where I spend most of my day serving other people are the days that I lay down at night feeling more fulfilled. Wow. Yeah. So. I would say start from a place of just giving, mm -hmm. right? And find somebody who, it's so hard right now mm -hmm. to find a true friend slash accountability mm -hmm. partner. Yeah. It is so hard because everybody's addicted to all the positive things on social media. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody's yes people, mm -hmm. right? Everybody uh, doesn't want to get their feelings hurt, but the, the best friends that you can have are the ones just say, hey man, that wasn't cool. Yeah. That wasn't cool. I've had it done to me and I've done it to a lot of people and you know, you, you lose some people around you, but do you really want those people around mm -hmm. you anyways? You know? So my opinion and what really has saved me a lot of grief in my life, especially from an entrepreneurial standpoint, if you are a yes person, you're going to find yourself in some big trouble. Mm. Uh, I even <laughs> coined a term uh, in my last business called yeah. FitFo. Okay, right? and I won't cuss on your podcast, <laughs> but it stands for figure it the f out. Yeah, because everybody would come to me with all of their problems, and I was the fixer, mm. and it drove me nuts. Mm -hmm. And what I realize is, am I really fixing the problem, mm. or am I just putting a band aid on it? And am I robbing them of the opportunity to have that growth for themselves? Mm -hmm. So now I just people are walking to my office and blah blah blah. How do I do this? Well, Fitfo. Mm -hmm. People call, how do I do this? Oh, there's a website for that, www.fitfo.com. Right. So we got to go through these experiences. Just because you have a mentor and just because you have somebody that says it, you've got to go through the experience. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, you got, and, and to, to your point right now, like you've got to teach a man how to fish, right? And we talked, we, we had uh, a meeting about that the other day where like I've got all kinds of people that are at a pretty high level in our company now that now... Like I've kind of removed myself from, I don't really have that problem anymore, but now I have people on my team who have that problem where like people below them go to them now and, and I'm, start, I'm trying to coach them on how to say no, go figure it out, right? Because you're, and I was, I was talking to somebody, one of my director of operations the other day um, and I was, I was telling her, I was like, look, like you, you can't, I was like, you're doing them a disservice by giving them the answer because then they're not learning anything. Like you're not, I'm like, you can do it for them. Sure. Like you can yeah. fill it out for them or do the, whatever yeah. their, whatever their question yeah. is, yeah. but they're not, what, how do they benefit yeah. from that? Oh, they're learning something. They're learning that you're the person that fixes all the problems. <laughs> right. So if I just go to Austin, you know, he'll take yeah. care of everything. Yeah. For yeah. Me. Yeah. So you're right. Like find, find a group of people mm -hmm. that tell you like it is. Yeah. And if you can't, then you know what? Better to stay by yourself. Listen to podcasts. Listen to uh, YouTube videos. You know what? What are go through your social media right now mm. and look at all the things that you follow, right? If you look at my social media, I've got all cars, yeah. right? I follow every main manufacturer and people who are into cars and personal development stuff, mm. right? So when I'm scrolling, that's the stuff that I see, right? And let's just be honest with ourselves: we are all somewhat 
different levels addicted to media mm -hmm. and our telephones. For sure. And I'm not saying it's great, but there are a lot of great things on there that you can learn. Yeah. But there's also a lot of bad. So you look, I'm not going to go through your social media media and filter your stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you've got to do it. We've got to do that. Yeah. So I agree, man. I love that. I want to talk a little in a little while. I want to get into tarot and all of that. And I know people watching probably want us to talk about that. And we will. Uh, before we do, though, I want to talk about sales. And I yeah. want to talk about like transitioning into your sales journey. You door knocked for a really long time. Yeah. Hey there, thank you for tuning into the content of this channel. Since you're here real quick, you know I'm a real estate guy, right? I've been wholesaling real estate since 2014, and that's about a decade, right? And I've done a little over 2,000 wholesale deals all over the country in that time. And for a long time, I've had people reach out via DM, via email, and in the comments section asking if I offered mentorship or education or any sort of group training. And for the longest time, I turned everybody down because my focus was to be one of the top wholesalers in the nation. And that day is finally here. My company pretty much runs on autopilot and my organization does at a very minimum one to two wholesale deals every single day. And that is why I'm so excited to announce our new private coaching program, Flippin' Simple. So whether you're looking to wholesale your very first deal or you're already doing a handful of deals a month and you're looking to scale, I've put together a waiting list so that you can be one of the very first people to find out when the program drops. Spots are of course limited, so go ahead and click the link down below to be a part of the wait list, and somebody on my team will reach out to see if you're a good fit. Now let's go ahead and get back to the video. And then you ended up building a, a fairly large yep. um, security company, yeah, right? Yeah, fifth largest alarm company in the country, America's Security, yeah. Pretty wild, yeah. okay, <laughs> really wild. And you still, you sold that, but you still do some um, uh, consulting. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is really cool. So talk to me about like the importance of sales and, you know, do you think that, you know, Andy Elliott, uh, I, I'm sure, I, I don't know if you heard, you said you listened to it a few times, I'm sure yeah. you caught it, yeah. but he was saying that, you know, salespeople suck right now, pretty much. Oh, 100%. Like, do you agree with that? 100%. I mean, I'm, as somebody who takes sales extremely seriously, I get offended, mm. right? And uh, I, I feel bad because they just really don't have somebody teaching them the right things and they're not taking the initiative themselves. Uh, so let me backtrack a little bit mm. to how I got into sales okay. because I really didn't know anything about sales getting out of high school. And so I ended up working at Safeway, <laughs> right? They have Safeway here. It's a grocery store, right? And this was in Oregon. I stocked shelves. I faced aisles, clean up aisle three. That was me. Somebody brought in some rotten milk. I'd smell it. Right. <laughs> and, uh, I made five fifteen an hour. Mm. Right. And I did it for three weeks. And I want to tell you, Here's what was really interesting about it. There were three people on shift with me at any given moment. Mm. And what had happened over time is I was raised to do everything at the best of your ability all the time, regardless. Nobody needs a cattle prod. Like you do the best of your ability all the time. And this ended up biting me in the butt because mm. I ended up doing most of the work. And these other two guys got really good at finding blind spots in the cameras and smoking cigarettes. Mm. Right. Here's where I got really hung up though. I didn't mind that because it kept me busy. I like mm -hmm. to work. Uh, where I got hung up is walking to the break room and I'm like seeing it right now in my mind replay as I talk about it. But we're walking into the break room. There's a little thing there where everybody grabs their checks. It's Friday, they're all excited. I had the same check they got, mm. same check. And I remember opening that check and kind of just pausing for a moment and looking at it going, man, that's not fair. Mm. Here I am doing probably a majority of the work by myself and they got the same check that I did. So that was really the flag for me that said, hey, sales is for you, right? Some of us aren't meant to have that label above our head that says you're you know, $15 an hour, $10 an hour. Some of us wanna kind of take it more into our own hands and say, I'm gonna put that label up there, sure. right? I'm, I'm gonna show you what I'm worth. And that, and that if that brings you excitement, mm -hmm. then you need to start with sales. And if you wanna be an entrepreneur, like I know that entrepreneurialism is the buzz right now, start in sales, mm. find a good sales organization, learn from a good sales organization like yours. And from there, decide what you want to do. What you might find is being an entrepreneur is what you love to do. Mm -hmm. um, Cause there's a lot of opportunities to do that within it. So I'm on the treadmill at the gym running, I'm running on the treadmill and this guy comes up to me 
And not only am I running on the treadmill, but I have headphones on. Okay. <laughs> so this guy comes up to me and he starts talking to me. So of course I stop on the treadmill yeah. and we're talking. He's trying to recruit me to go knock doors. Right. And so uh, we get to talking for a while. He was actually a really nice guy. And I said, okay, I mean, I'm living outside right now in that car in the parking lot. So why not? And so we end up driving down to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we start knocking on doors. And I immediately fell in love with the fact that I controlled my paycheck. And it gave me that, that, uh, that, that buzz, you know, Andy talked about it when yeah. he got that first sale, you know, and how it just started boiling through his veins and it just made him alive. Well, I think all great salespeople, they crave that feeling yeah. of just being alive. Yeah. I completely agree. So you door knocked for a long for time. For like 15 years, I knocked on doors. And door knocking can be brutal. It can be brutal. Yeah. But I mean, what did you learn from that? Like, what did oh, you learn from man. door knocking? Like, what was like the, the number one takeaway from door knocking, would you say? Communication. Mm. Uh, I am an introvert. Mm -hmm. Like, if, you know, I'm not having anything on my schedule, I'm going to be on a chair reading a book, mm. you know, by myself, or I'll be in my garden or. <laughs> My wife is going to die if she hears this playing Legos, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. As a grown man, but I'm just, I'm an introvert. I mm -hmm. like to keep to myself. Now uh, I've adapted mm -hmm. through sales and learned there's times to, you know, come out of your shell. Uh, and I, I think we all think, oh, I speak English. So my communication is fine. You know, I can talk with you. I can get my point across to you. But what we don't realize is that Dr. Morabian's law. Have you heard of that before? I have not. Okay, so this is a very mm. world-renowned study. Okay. And according to Dr. Morabian's law, only 7% of communication is the actual words coming out of your mouth. Mm. The majority of it is body language and tonality. Mm. And so, you know, when Andy talks about, oh, and you on the, on the last podcast talked about, oh, there's not any great salespeople anymore because they're, they're not understanding that, hey, there's another human in front of me. We're supposed right. to have a conversation. We're supposed to... Uh, a sale is a transfer of energy from one person to another. So if I'm not excited about the car that I'm selling, how can I expect you to be excited about it? You know, and that happens through tonality, through eye contact, through all these different communication skills that uh, I don't know if there's a high school course for that or if mm -hmm. families are teaching that in the house now, but door to door sales taught me that for through sure. A lot of this is not how you communicate. A lot of doors slammed in your face, a lot of people telling you to take a hike, get a real yeah. job, yelling at you. But it also develops this toughness, you know, this mm -hmm. thick skin. And when you talk about being calm, like I've had people yell at me a little bit, mm -hmm. you know. So I've been in extreme scenarios. Mm -hmm. So when you're in those and you, when you exposed yourself to extreme scenarios, it makes you seasoned for other scenarios to come. Mm, I love that. Yeah. yeah. I, I love door knocking. Yeah. I, when you told me you did it for so long, I was like, dude. That's pretty legit, you know, yeah. because I think like, uh, man, like there's nothing better, dude. Like if you're if you're a 18 year old kid and you're listening right now or 21 or 22 or whatever, you know, like go door knock. Yeah. Like go sell solar, like go try to buy somebody's house, like be a wholesaler, mm -hmm. but go door knock, you know, because yeah. like nobody. First of all, you have hardly any competition because there's very few people on the planet who are willing to do it. Right. I mean, and then um, second of all, everything you just said. Right. Yeah. Or vice versa. But you get the point. I yeah. mean, it's just like you have to do that. I'm a big shark tank buff. Mm -hmm. And in any business, you have to look at what's called cost of customer acquisition. Mm. Right. Well, what's the cost of customer acquisition when you're knocking doors? How many doors you can knock? Time. Yeah. It's just time. In a day. Yeah. So you don't have to. Oh, some people, you know, mm -hmm. I have close to eight percent. million dollars worth of inventory for my Turo fleet. You can't just get up and do that out of high school. You know, you have to establish yourself in order to get to that level, right? Yeah. Well, knocking on doors. So you have to start somewhere. I can't think of a better place to start, to be honest with you. If I had a son, I would push him to do sword door sales. That's mm -hmm. how much I believe in it. Yeah. It teaches you so much about yourself, communication, resilience, uh, pride mm -hmm. in accomplishing certain things. So a huge fan of door to door. Yeah. And mad respect to everybody else, anybody who's listening to this that does it. If anybody's thinking about doing it, it's got my huge stamp of approval. I love that, dude. Yeah. And your company's still doing that. Or not, I shouldn't say your company, but 
the company that you sold that you're still consulting for, are they still doing a lot of the door to door? Yeah, I'm so I'm more of a, a consultant now. Mm-hmm. I uh, stayed on with the largest ADT firm that bought my company. I, I stayed on with them for a year, and then uh, I just can't get away from it because I just yeah. love it so much. And I mostly love it by and we were talking about this before mm-hmm. this, the people. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not talking about the customers, although it's, it's awesome. You meet some, there's a lot of cool families out there that you get to meet, but the people that I got to meet that were like me, that you know, didn't have a college education, mm-hmm. right. They just had a fire in their belly. Right. And to give them a gift of saying, Hey, you know what? You, you don't need like, guess what your resume, you can crinkle that up and you can throw it in the trash can right now. Mm-hmm. All that matters is your eagerness to learn. Right. And your uh, ability to put in the work mm-hmm. every single day without question. So, yeah. I love that. It's so true, man. Sales is the one thing that, like, I feel like you, it, it, dude, it just, anybody could do it. There's no, and, 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 and there's no ceiling to what you can accomplish, right? Like, you know, I always, like, joke with, like, the people in my inner circle. I'm like, <laughs> Uh, I'm like, if, if I were to ever like, for some reason, just lose everything again, right? Like, I don't know, God, it just didn't work out. Right. Like all my companies just went away. Like, dude, I could go make a few million dollars a year just being a sales guy all by myself. Like I could just go find anybody, whether it be Grant Cardone or Andy, L, whoever, right. You give me a phenomenal product to sell and I could sell, right. Like I, if I needed to, you know, and it's just such a, a beautiful attribute, I think for, for people to have, right. Cause you kind of always have that like in your back pocket, like, Hey, like if I have to go produce, even like <clears throat> there's been times, not, any, not anymore, obviously, I'm sure you could relate where like, um, when we were a little smaller, where somebody would leave our company, you know, a top sales guy, and I'd have to step back in to, to that role, you know, in, in, in any given time you can step back in and be the number one performer if you have to be right. Which is a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it just, it, look, it doesn't just apply to the money that you make, right? Are you selling in your relationship? Oh, all day long. Or, I mean, are you, you're selling every day all yeah, the time. For sure. And so if you can't learn to master that skill, you, you're you going to need a helmet mm-hmm. for life, for real. It's yep. just something that you need to have a relationship with sales. Mm-hmm. And I think the sooner people realize that and the sooner they dive into it, the better that they're going to be. And to your point, I totally agree. What's great is nobody's disqualified. No, I mean, I'll have training classes full of like 50 people sometimes. And I'll say, here's the good news. You guys are all super qualified to be yeah. here. All right. But you're all equal today. Mm. Tomorrow you're not because somebody's going to go home and they're going to really put their feet to the fire and they're going to start researching. They're going to mm. start learning. They're going to start growing. They're going to go to sleep early. They're going to work out. They're going to start doing all some things that maybe other people aren't going to do. And they're going to start separating themselves. Mm. So, if you're one of those people that has a great work ethic like I do and I know you do, mm-hmm. then that's exciting. Yeah. Because you're like, man, I can build something. For sure. Like, I can't wait to see what I can accomplish and what I can do. So uh, let the money do what it does. Mm-hmm. Right? I had a guy come to me the other day and he's looking to, to find a job. And I said, well, the best advice I can give you is it doesn't matter who's paying you the most. Where are you going mm-hmm. and where do you feel like you can learn the most to get there? Like stop focusing mm. on, and this is a big plague in the door to door industry is people will go, Oh, I can make the most money over here. I can make $25 per sale more over here. And it's like, that's should not be the most important thing to you right now. Mm. Uh, you should be looking at where can I get the most value learning and growing? Where can I, where can I be around a team? Like the team that you guys have around here where you walk in and you just get that vibe, right? Where it just, you just want to produce more. You want to do more. You want to be better. You want, that's what you got to look for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, tr- truly incredible, man. I love that. What was the biggest challenge, would you say, in building like either one of the companies that you've built? You know, you've obviously built this the fifth largest security, um, yeah. you know, in the nation, right? And then on the Turo side, like what what was one of the biggest challenges maybe on the security side, just starting there? Because I know on the security side, it was more people. Yeah. So. I mean, I'm just going to share a real story with, with how I lost everything when I was 30. So we had eight offices. Um, we were the fifth largest security company in the country. And I kind of 
let some of the, uh, I don't know if you'd call it HR or like some of that stuff slip through the cracks. Cause I was just like, let's grow sales. Let's just get big. Let's get, you know, more homes, more of this, more. And what happened was, uh, one of the sales reps that we hired stole a ring doorbell mm. off of somebody's front porch. And immediately ADT calls me and they shut me down. They're like, we're not buying any more contracts from you. Right. And here I am with eight leases. I've got hundreds of people that their livelihood depends mm. on me. And so I kept going. They, they let me install accounts that they just didn't pay me. Mm. And so I slowly started selling this and then I sold that and then I sold this. And so I went from having three houses, a warehouse full of exotic cars, uh, to me and Heidi with a newborn moving in to her parents' house. Mm. So you, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to kind of have a real conversation with yourself about, you know, if, if shit gets rough, like, am I going to stick this out? M my attorney, my accountant, everybody, Brandon, file BK. Just file BK, and I didn't do it. Mm. I stuck it out. I, I remember one night, I'm, and, you know, woe is me, right? I'm driving home in my Rolls Royce Ghost, poor Brandon, Right. But I'm in my driveway and I know everything is falling apart. It's only a matter of time before everything is gone. And I'm sitting in my driveway and I go, I have to show up for my family right now. And I was just bawling, mm. just bawling. So look, when you see people who have a massive amount of success, not only should you have a big amount of respect for them, but you should want to learn from them. You should want to grow from them. And it should inspire you to get through the hard times. If you go and watch a movie, like, is there any such thing as a movie where it's just all sunshine and rainbows, the entire movie? Mm -hmm. what, what fun would a movie be to watch if mm -hmm. the entire scene was just great things happening? Right. There's a problem. Mm -hmm. Something goes wrong. Yeah. Somebody gets hurt. Somebody loses something. But then they triumph over that at the end. Every movie. Yeah. So look, if you want a fulfilled life and you want to be happy, like you have to also understand that with that is going to come some serious adversity, mm. some serious problems, right? And they're tests. Mm. They're tests for you to see how bad you, that's how I look at it. Yeah. I look at it as God going, okay, you said you want this. We're going to find out how much you really want this. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, I've been blessed, even though I'm only 38 years old, to have come from nothing, mm -hmm. did very well had it all stripped away from me and built it back up again to yeah. where, you know, when that, that mindset I had when I was little of money will buy you happiness. Mm -hmm. Now I realize money is just an exchange of things. You know, it's the relationships. It's mm -hmm. like coming and hanging out yeah. with you. It's like going home to my family. Like you start to value things that really matter. Mm. I love that so much. Yeah. yeah. What kept you going? Like when you, when you moved back in with, uh, Heidi's parents. Yeah. When you moved back in there with your newborn, like, yeah. or like what, what kept you from filing BK? Like what everybody was telling you to do that? Like yeah. how, like, what was the thing that like, you know what I mean? Like, what was that, yeah. that thing that kept you going? So I, I think about this a lot and it's kind of funny, but I imagine myself when I'm old sitting on a lake, I have this whole place drawn out. Right? <laughs> I'm sitting on a lake in a rocking chair, my kids are with me, their families are with me, and I'm retired and I'm alone with my thoughts, mm. right? Does it really matter how much money you have in your bank account at that moment? You're gonna be alone with your thoughts, mm -hmm. right? Here's what I want going through my head. I did everything I could, I gave it hell, right? And that is gonna make me happy when I'm older, right? Not hundred million in my bank account, a billion in my bank account. Like I, I'm totally cool with that falling wherever it falls. Mm -hmm. Right. But I want to sit there with a massive amount of fulfillment that mm -hmm. I lived up to my potential. You know, Ed, my let talks about hell would be to die and meet the man you could have been. Mm. I'm, I'm definitely on a pursuit to meet that man. Yeah. I love that so yeah. much, dude. Yeah. Really cool. You know, and another question I have before we dive into the, the tarot and what you've done there is like Heidi, you know, she stuck it out with you too, right? 
And and I always like to talk as much as I can in when in the podcast that I do in particular. Everybody has kind of kind of got their own. I watch a lot of podcasts too, and everybody's got their own methodology in which they interview and what they choose to talk about. I like talking about like relationships a lot, and and relationships in particular, like um, the relationship you have with Heidi, right? Like, and you know, what was it about like? Cause she could have left, right? Like she could have been like, you know, sometimes you see these relationships where like, I don't know if people get into the wrong relationship or, uh, you know, where like they're not on the same page. Like, you know, you've got like somebody who's maybe an entrepreneur or wants to be an entrepreneur, another person who, you know, like I think people get into relationships like for the wrong reason. Right. And it's cool to see, you know, and obviously Heidi, I know Heidi, she's just an incredible human being. Um, but, you know, like, what would you recommend it? Like, how do people find that, right? Like, I guess is my question. Like, how do people find that ride or die? Like, how did you find Heidi? Like, how, and then how would you recommend that people figure out how to find somebody that, that truly is like gonna be a life partner for them? Yeah. No bigger decision you'll ever make in your entire life than mm -hmm. who you're gonna spend it with. I mean, there's nothing that even comes close. And again, thankfully, as a matter of perspective, I had two really bad relationships mm. before I met Heidi. So the second me and Heidi came into contact, it was like, wow, I can really appreciate this. Mm. Whereas had those two past relationships not happened, I probably would have screwed it up. I just wasn't ready for it. So, you know, I hear a lot, become the pers you know, person you want to attract. Mm -hmm. So you, you really have to do that. And then I, should you say, oh, I'm not going to be with anybody unless they're absolutely perfect and they check every single box that I have? No. But I, I will tell you this. When I was growing up in high school, I had a church leader who um, I, I had broken up. Well, somebody had broken up with me. We'll, we'll say it the correct mm -hmm. way. And I thought my world was ending. You know, it was my first breakup. And I remember him looking at me and he said, Brandon, well, what is it that you want in a significant other? And the shallow 16 year old Brandon goes, well, she's got to be hot. Yeah. Right. And all these things. And he goes, okay, well that's cool, but that ain't gonna last forever. Yeah. And so he said, why don't you write it out? Uh huh. And so I actually sat there and I wrote out with him all the qualities that I was looking for in a significant other. And by the way, we did that for a career after that. Right. So if you're going to attract that person, you need to one, mm -hmm. be the part. And two, you need to know exactly what it is that you're looking for. Mm. Uh, otherwise, you just fall into these comfort zones, right? Where people just, oh, I'm comfortable because I'm used to that person. And then you start to get into this, this bad rut. So mm -hmm. I don't think there's just one person for everybody. Yeah. You know, I think two people who align in values can be great soulmates. Mm. And so you, you definitely got to act the part. You know, I, I heard that same exact um, thing at one point. Somebody gave me that advice. They said, write down all the qualities of the person that you're looking for and then write down on a different piece of paper all the qualities that that person would be looking for in their mate. And you have to now become that person to attract that person. Yeah. You know, yeah. like what would they be looking for? Yeah. So right? me and Heidi's first house, when we moved in together. We, we had zero furniture, nothing. Mm -hmm. We rolled up towels for pillows, right? This was our first house. So when Heidi met me, I was, I mean, I still to this day sometimes go, I don't know what she saw in this dude. <laughs> I'm knocking doors, right? I'm yeah. living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck. Uh, just broken dude, still trying to find my way in life. And that's when I met her. We've been together for 15 years. Mm. So, um, you know, she's been through all that. She's been mm. ultra supportive Never once have I ever thought she didn't love me or support me. Um, she's always been there for me. Mm. And I, I don't think you can accomplish great things unless you have somebody like that by your side. I agree. I really I agree. don't. Well, there's an old quote. Uh, you, might, you might know it, but it's like behind every great man is like an even greater woman, right? Mm. And you, you do. You hear that a lot, you know, like, and I, I can definitely attribute, you know, a lot of the what I'm able to do for, you know, most day, right? And um, so I couldn't agree more. Yeah. If if the person that you're with, if you don't look at them and go, man, you inspire me to be better, then 
you might want to think about moving on to a better relationship or at least trying to find a way to patch For sure. the way things are right now because the person you're with should inspire you to be better, mm. not to make you feel okay with going nowhere. That's my that. personal opinion about a relationship. When I, I look at Heidi yeah. every day, like this morning, yeah. when neither one of us in the morning want to do Peloton and we're kind of looking at each other on the couch, she gives me that look of, Really quick, if you're a real estate agent in the state of Arizona and you're looking to join a phenomenal team, then I would love to have a conversation with you. If you're looking for an incredible culture, you're looking for lead generation, you're looking for transaction coordination, then I would love to have a conversation and see if you would be a great fit for our team, okay? So again, if you're an agent in the state of Arizona, make sure you text the number 480-418-5339, the word agent okay again 480-418-5339 the word agent now let's go ahead and get back to the show get your you know what on because it's time to go yeah and so she just inspires me to be better mm, very yeah, important to find somebody like that very 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 cool phenomenal advice the oh. there's been multiple times already throughout the podcast and we're about to have uh, a few more where people are going to do the 15 second playback like you talked about you yeah. know and they're going to do it 10 or 15 times yeah uh, it's a new one I'm learning, you know, I got to now every time I'm watching a podcast, I'm going to keep hitting the 15, you know, the back yeah. 15, you know, so I can keep until yeah. I memorize. Right. Um, well, I want to I want to transition now a little bit into tarot, obviously, okay. and yeah. it's what you're doing currently. So it's exciting. Yeah. Right. Of course. And uh, so, you know, as we talked about in the beginning, you have 150 or over 150 cars yeah. on it, like between 150 and 200. Is that safe to say? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, cars on the Turo platform. Um, and I'm sure you've sold a bunch too. Yeah. So like you, over the course of time, you probably had a lot more than that. It yeah. changes day to day. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And you said a little while ago, you have 8 million currently in inventory in yeah. terms of your uh, fleet, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, like, you know, I know that for, but for people watching, you know, like, I guess like start from like, why did you get into Turo? And then we'll, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. So I've, always been a car nut just absolutely obsessed with cars there's probably not a day goes by that i don't spend two hours looking at cars on the internet heidi, <laughs> heidi said the other day she goes i'm pretty sure you've seen every car on the internet already like enough put it down uh i i remember growing up in hawaii we lived on kamehameha freeway i would sit on one of those white lawn chairs that you get from walmart mm -hmm. and just watch cars drive by and there's not super exotic cars in hawaii right but yeah. th that's I would just watch cars and then it would get dark and I would try and guess the car by the tail light or the headlight. Mm. So I've always been fascinated and loved cars, right? Not the, um, I've been blessed to have a lot of exotic cars in my life and it's not the, Oh, look at me. It's the, mm -hmm. like, I just love, like, this is unique. Like mm -hmm. you don't see this a lot. Like look at the architect, like I'm looking at little details. And so mm. I have a extreme passion for cars. So that's one of the reasons why I got into it. The second reason why I got into Turo is um, there are certain industries nowadays that rely on you just needing something mm. to where there's no longer the customer service element, mm -hmm. right? And no offense to any companies, but I have rented a decent amount of cars in my life traveling for work. And I have not always had the greatest experience. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, majority of the time, I didn't have a good experience at all. Mm -hmm. And so I remember traveling to LA one day and a guy said, hey, uh, let's meet at one o'clock. And I said, okay, well, you know, my, my flight lands at 11, mm -hmm. so I may be late. And he's like, why? And I go, I got to get a car. And he goes, just Turo. And at the time, I'd never heard of Turo before. And mm -hmm. so I'm like, okay, what is that? And he goes, oh, it's just an app. Download it and get a car and they'll deliver it to you. Mm -hmm. And so I get on the app and I get an M4 for the same price I would have paid for my Challenger, mm, right? That mm -hmm. I normally get my V6 Challenger. I get my bags at LAX. And now they don't do this anymore, but at the time they did. I get my bags at LAX. I walk out and the guy is standing there with a the car holding the keys. Like grabbing my bag, walk out yeah. right there. And I remember looking at him and I go, dude, you got to be kidding me. Are you serious? Mm. And he goes, yeah. And I, and I go, well, do I got to take you somewhere now? Or like, what happens? And he goes, no, you're good to go, man. Just uh, shoot me a text when you're going to come back and I'll come grab it from you. And fireworks went off in my head. <laughs> I'm like, this is genius. Mm -hmm. I don't see how anybody, this is like somebody saying, hey, give me your uh, cell phone back. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just grab this roll of quarters and go to a payphone? 
Sure. Right. The second you had a cell phone in your hand, you were like, I'm never going back mm -hmm. to using a payphone. And this is why we don't see payphones anymore. So I went home. I remember talking to Heidi about it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna buy a couple of cars off of Craigslist and I'm gonna try this out. Because anybody can go on there and be a host. You just gotta yeah. sign up. So I got a couple of twenty to thirty thousand dollar Mercedes and BMW cars that still had that hundred thousand dollar feel for them. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, if you're listening to this, don't buy those cars. That's a bad Turo move. Mm -hmm. But this was my current state of mind with okay. uh, what I knew. And they actually did really good. Mm -hmm. And I had fun with it. And I'm like, man, this is a great business. And what I love about it is I get to rate every guest that picks up one of my cars. And we've got close to 10,000 trips now. Every one of them has a rating that we get to give them. But they also get to rate us. Mm. So both of us are held to a higher standard than we would be at Hertz or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it promotes hosts like myself to create a good environment. You've been in my mm -hmm. warehouse. I mean, you walk in there and you've got two... 90 inch TVs, a pool table, a bar, uh, lounge chairs, like it's made for people to come and relax and yeah. just a better experience. Right. So, uh, those are the two things that got me into it. Yeah, yeah. I love that dude. Well, how do they do it now, by the way, you said back then, like he was just standing there holding the key. Yeah. So now airports, because you know, pressure from the rental car companies, I'm sure are trying to push Turo out. So now yeah. they like police it and make sure that you don't do that. So you have to go to an offsite location, which still, by the way, is a better alternative yeah. than a traditional Hertz or I shouldn't even say that company. How do bleep, you get, how do you get to, yeah. Bleep that out. <laughs> <laughs> how do you get to that location? Like, is it complicated? Like if I were to fly into Sky Harbor and I was going to tear out one of your cars, like how do I, how do I, physically get to the location where I can get in the car. Yeah. So it, it'll be on site and we'll send okay. you directions specifically on how to get there. Okay. Uh, or you can come get it from our location, which is 10 minutes. Uh, so like take an Uber. Just, yeah. 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 Okay. Got it. Yeah. yeah it makes sense. Um, but think about the time it takes to grab your bags, wait for the bus. Have you seen the lines for the yeah, bus at I have. Uh, Sky Harbor sometimes? Mm -hmm. Like I'll look at them going, oh my gosh, these people are going to be here for an hour. Literally. And then when they get on the bus and get off, then they have to wait in another line and then they got to go find their car. So even if you took an Uber, it's probably going to be quicker. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's if they come to you. I mean, they could also just like, because can't they take like a bus or something and go to the lot to pick the car up? Yeah. At Sky Harbor? Or how do they get to the lot? Um, they can they can take a bus, the okay. tram, walk. Well, depending yeah. on what terminal, I guess, they fly into yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then when you started, so you started, you said that now you wouldn't recommend, right, the three uh, Mercedes and BMW, $30,000 that felt like a hundred that, you know, yeah. uh, what would you recommend now? You know, if somebody was watching and they were like, man, like, I really like this Turo idea, right? Yeah. Like, what would be a car that you would confidently be able to say, hey, start with this car? Yeah. Uh, cheaper import uh, economy cars that... Uh, are preferably under warranty. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about this when you were at my warehouse. I mean, the two biggest pitfalls in our particular industry is people don't take into consideration depreciation and how much is it going to cost to maintain this vehicle. Mm. Cheryl's not maintaining your car. Mm. You know, if you write a check for $150,000 for a C8 Corvette that stickers for 70 and five years later, you got to sell it, you're taking that hit. Mm -hmm. So you got it. And, and this is where my benefit for looking at cars for two hours every day, like you can, I'm a walking Kelly blue book. Mm -hmm. You can point at a car in a lot. I'll ask you how many miles are on it. And I'll give you a very good idea of how much that car is worth. Mm -hmm. So that was a great skill to have going into Turo to know, Hey, that's a good deal on a car. That's a good deal on the car. A lot of the money is made when you buy the car. Mm. Yeah. And you skip some depreciation for sure. It's just like real estate. Yeah. You, you make money in the buy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love that. Wow. So economy cars, cheaper cars. Um, you know, obviously, I'm going to link everything down below. And I'm going to, there'll be ads in here telling people to go watch the the tour that I toured of your operation. Um, so definitely go watch that. You know, you have, you have a lot, you have, you like the Fiat, right? Uh, and, and I love the Fiat. We did like B-roll of the Fiat, right? And you have 50 of them, give or take, right? 50? Yeah. Um, and you were telling me in your office, you said, I asked you like what the cheapest Fiat that you ever bought was. And you were saying like 1700, 1700 bucks. Wow. And Did they an oil change on it when I got <laughs> it. 
did a nice detail on it, <laughs> yeah. and it has been out on the streets ever since. You still have that particular Fiat? I still got that particular wow. Fiat. I haven't sold a Fiat. So. You've only ever bought? Yeah. I, when did you buy that Fiat for 1700 How long uh, ago? It's been probably eight to 10 months mm -hmm. since I bought that one. And and how many trips would you say it's been on? It's probably got 60 to 80 trips on it, would okay. be my guess. At what would you say the average trip, roughly? Would it, About like, 30 bucks a day. Okay. And the, the other reason why I recommend cheaper cars to get started is the lower the barrier to entry for renting the car, the higher the utilization will be. Mm. So uh, typically on that car, I, I mean, if you go on to Turo and look for the cheapest cars, they're going to all be mine because they're all Fiat's, yeah. right? They're 20 to 30 bucks a day. And so people will get them sometimes for months at a time. Really? We've had a booking for six months. Wow. And so that goes to your bottom line, right? Because you give, not Do you give people it. a discount for that? Yeah, they get discounts okay. for longer periods. Okay, yeah. And you can customize all this stuff in the app, which is really, really? cool. So uh, if you know, you're looking to be a Turo host, it is fun, especially if you love cars. Uh, but there's a lot of things you got to be particular about. So do some research on cars, get familiar with cars. Um, we'll probably do some more content yep. on it soon. So I'm really excited about that. We spent a couple hours talking about that. So mm -hmm. really pumped about that. Um, but it's like any business. Do you, you can learn the hard way or you can learn from somebody else learning the hard way. Mm -hmm. And it's a much cheaper to learn from somebody else's mistakes. So sure. I've made a lot of mistakes uh, that can avoid a lot of those pitfalls. Mm -hmm. How is the luxury car like Turo industry? Like, you know, you, you obviously you have a uh, Ferrari 488, you've got the Huracan. You said the Huracan is the number one. Was it the number one? The yeah, number one Arizona. grossing car in Arizona? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the Huracan, two Rolls Royces, a Dawn and a, and a Wraith. Yep. A Dawn and a Wraith. Dawn and a Wraith. Yep. Um, bunch of G wagons. Um, what else? You've got, got a bunch Bentleys, of Bentleys. We've got Maseratis. Uh, we've got a McLaren. We've got Aston Martins. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of cool Highline cars that, well, I mean, where else would you go to rent something For like sure. this? You know? you, I don't know that yeah. you can go anywhere else, right? Yeah. So what do you think about that game? Like, can anybody play that game or do you got to work your way up to play that? You probably got to work your way up to play that game, right? I mean, I mean you, you could, but it's a little riskier, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I look at the Fiats as being rabbits, right? They're mm -hmm. going to go out and they're going to make a couple pennies here and there, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're my base, right? And the, the exotics are more el like an elephant of, hey, this elephant could sit on me or it could really gain me some serious traction. Mm. So, <laughs> you know, I've had a month where I made 25 grand on the Huracan. Right? On one car. Yeah, but I've it's in the shop right now and I haven't made anything this month or last month mm. from somebody who damaged it. So... You know, it, it's a big risk if you do that with big rewards. So starting out, I wouldn't recommend those cars, especially because you have to look at your market, right? Mm -hmm. When I started Turo, nobody had these cool cars, and I just flooded the market with them, mm -hmm. right? And so we kind of created a market for nice cars. But still, there's we're not in L.A. or Miami, mm -hmm. right? So every Turo host can't have a Ferrari, and we all make money. Mm -hmm. So you really have to look at the market penetration, and is this something that makes sense? And mm -hmm. thankfully, Turo has some good analytics on their app that can help you make good decisions on cars. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and I bet that you could have a lot more people that have the lower-end car on Turo, like a significant amount more, and still there be people who rent them. Yeah. Because just of the sheer amount of people who are going to continue to find out about Turo and want to rent a car on Turo yeah. as opposed to maybe some of the other companies that we were talking about a little while ago that maybe over time are either going to go out of business or lose a lot of the market share. Yeah. Just strictly because yeah. of how complicated it is. And when you're starting out, you're going to have to figure out your process, right? Because Turo doesn't say, here's a franchise. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the playbook for how you do everything. You have to come up with your own, how does, how do I do this? How am I going to communicate with my customers? You know, how am I going to clean my car? How am I going to deliver my car? How am I like all these things you have to figure out? And I wouldn't recommend going through that learning curve on a really high end car because you could make mistakes that could be very costly. Yeah, very costly, I'd yeah. imagine, right? Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of little stuff I feel like. Like you, you know, obviously we went to your shop and we toured your operation. I mean, and there's a, you know, I, I was, I'm a very particular guy. I pay attention to the details, right? And there's a lot of little, details that I noticed of things that I could tell that you learned along the way, right? Like 
you've got a key box like outside of your deal where people can drop off at night or yeah. whatever. You have, you know, cameras outside and then there's certain cars that people can just go rent, you know, 24 hours a day. And, and there's a lot of thought I can tell that you put into every detail of yeah. just every little thing that you could think of that, um, you need any, any standard operating procedure that needed to get implemented in order for you to scale effectively and efficiently and profitably. You've put thought into that. Yeah. So, yeah. Even if you're just in sales by yourself, right? If you're knocking on doors by yourself, okay, this applies to you. If you're an entrepreneur, this definitely applies to you. There's only two ways you can grow. You're either going to get more leads, more customers, or you're going to get more efficient with them, right? The great entrepreneurs, the great salespeople do both simultaneously. Mm -hmm. They're constantly figuring out ways of how do I add more customers, mm -hmm. right? And how do I make that experience more efficient? to inhibit me to allow more customers to come in, right? Mm -hmm. So I go through growth spurts, right? Where I'm like, okay, I you don't just go from mm -hmm. five cars to 150. Like everything changes as mm -hmm. volumes go up. Sure. So, you know, you expand your capacity. It gets stressed, right? Through those stresses, you realize I've got to, I've, something's got to change here, right? We're, we're getting bad reviews. By the way, customers are your greatest source mm -hmm. of telling you where your holes are in your bucket, right? I love bad reviews. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love bad reviews, which everybody thinks I'm crazy, but I love bad reviews mm -hmm. because this is a real life customer telling you their perspective about your process. Mm -hmm. And most of the time they're right, mm -hmm. right? It's an opportunity for you to get better. So expand, let the chain break, mm -hmm. figure out how to fix it to where you're very efficient. You're like maximized efficiency for the amount of volume that you have and then expand it again. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of been my philosophy in business. I did it with my security company. I, I'm doing it with this, right? Soon we'll be at a point where we've got a clean cut platform that makes sense that I can then duplicate in other cities. Yeah, I really love that. Yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal advice. And I think that especially for somebody building a tarot operation or trying to attempt to do tarot at all, they have to, they have to be able to figure that out and, and dial that in. Um, what, what is like one of the best car or what, sorry, what is one of the worst cars that you've ever bought in, um, on tarot and why? So I told you a little bit about my M6 that I got in Gilbert, yeah. by the way, and I got it off of Craigslist. So like, here's a car that's, what, 150 grand brand new, mm -hmm. and 10 years later, it's 25 grand. So I'm thinking, yeah, great. So people are going to love this. It's going to fly off the shelf, which it did, but there's also parts that flew off the shelf uh, <laughs> when I bought it. So a uh, lot of problems, mm -hmm. very expensive to maintain. Um, you know, there's some cars you're going to get where you think, oh, this, this, this is going to crush. And it doesn't, you know, I bought a brand new Lotus and it broke a windshield. They're four grand. There's nobody here that services Lotuses. Mm. Uh, so, you know, what good is a warranty on a brand new car if there's no dealer here <laughs> to service it? Right. So yeah. I've made a lot of really dumb uh, things. Some things you just don't know until you go into it. Other things had you just stopped and thought about it, I probably could have figured out, but uh, growing pains for mm. sure. There's a mm -hmm. lot of them. Yeah. yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah. I, I feel like, um, you have a P and L, you know, for every car you've talked every about that Every car has its own separate P and L. Mm. So at the end of every month, I can look at every single car and go, that car made money. That car lost money. Everything gets itemized to that particular car. Mm. I'm very analytical with numbers. Uh, cause if you're not watching your numbers, your business will start to go downhill quickly. So, uh, yeah, you got to know your numbers. Mm -hmm. That's another good, important, you know, whether it's a Turo business or in your business, like if you don't have your numbers right and you don't know where they're at, then it's going to catch you in the end. For sure. Yeah, a million percent. Yeah, and Turo, I would imagine, like, because you talked a lot about, like, the misconception of, like, one of the biggest mistakes being the fact that people don't factor in depreciation, right? And, and that's a big one that I think people probably overlook that one more than any other mistake, would you say? Yeah, yeah, 100%. In tarot? Yeah. What would you say the second biggest mistake next to people not factoring in the depreciation? What's like that next mistake that people make that you think? Hey, real quick, I don't know if you know, but I have a totally separate YouTube channel that you probably haven't checked out before. And it's just called Austin Zayback. And I've actually started a new series on that channel where I break down wholesale deals, okay? Wholesale deals that we've done in our business and I show you step by step how we got the deal, how we sold the deal, I break down all the numbers on the deal and I even show you the HUD 
of the deal. So you know we're not playing around. Now, I don't know how long you've been following me, but I do anywhere from one to two wholesale deals every single day. And my goal is to get to 100 deal breakdowns on that YouTube channel. So definitely, if you haven't already, go check it out. I'll link it down in the description below. And without further ado, let's just go ahead and get back to the show. Uh, getting maintenance heavy vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, cars that typically break down that are hard to find parts for. Like you're the gonna, yeah, yeah, you're gonna fall into this when you get into the exotic category, right? You, I'm, I mean, I've got a Bentley right now that's just sitting in my shop because the part I had to order is on a boat from Europe. <laughs> Not on a plane, a boat. Yeah. So, you know, you're just stuck. You're at the mercy of these parts. You know, you can't go on to Craigslist mm -hmm. and buy a part for a Bentley. Mm. So uh, get go with the cars that are popular, that people know, that you can find parts very easily for. They're not expensive so that you don't end up having a car sitting, right? Mm -hmm. Because a car that's sitting there, not only is it not making you money, it's costing you money. For sure. Yeah, yeah like you said, the Huracan is in the shop right now. Been there for over a month, right? And you can't rent it out. No. You know, you can't do anything with yeah. it. So it's just a three hundred thousand dollar piece of my inventory that's generating zero revenue. Right, and it's costing you money to sit there. Yeah, every day it's getting older. It's technically depreciating. It's depreciating. Technically, you know, I mean, some of those cars obviously hold their go up their in value, but technically it's depreciating with time, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's just sitting there. You know, like you insurance, I'd imagine, you know, all the things that you have to keep paying for, right? Yeah. If you have a payment or you, if somebody has a loan on a car, then yeah. they've got to keep making the payment, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, if you didn't have the capital to, and you didn't have the all the other fleet or inventory that you have that was being rented out, that could be a huge problem. Like imagine if somebody watching just had a Huracan and it was in the shop for a month and a half, yeah. you're, you're, you're done, Yeah, you're out, yeah. you know? I, I would say the third thing that is, probably never talked about is I'm a big fan of you can take an opportunity like knocking on doors or wholesaling real estate or during Turo, you can take that opportunity and make minimum wage. Mm. So if, if you're going to jump over that ledge into being an entrepreneur or a salesperson with, you know, entrepreneurial aspirations, then you have to always have a what's next mentality, mm. right? Don't get complacent with where you're at because then you'll stop moving forward. Mm. And so, you know, you asked me before, how did you get through the hard times that I had with my other company? It was just like, I, I love what Andy said on the podcast where he goes, I'm not afraid of losing all my money. I'm afraid mm. of not making progress. Mm. That was mm. so good. And cause I, I vibe with that so much, right? Mm. Like we, you have to figure out a way to grow because somebody's chasing you, mm. right? They're chasing your market share, right? They're chasing your customers. And they're ultimately chasing your dollars. For so sure. if you can't keep growing, you're going to slowly wither away. Mm -hmm. So don't get stuck in just, oh, I'm going to run out these two cars and then just, yeah. you know, get into the monotonous day to day things without thinking about, okay, how am I, what am I, what's the plan here? Mm -hmm. How does this two cars go to four? How does the four cars go to eight? How does the eight go to 150? Yeah. Yeah. And I'd imagine, yeah, like, you, you know, just the little stuff, right? Yeah, figuring out like how do you wash the cars and how do you, you know, because when you get to your level, like you got to hire people. Like, you know, when we toured your operation, like you have a mechanic full time. Yeah. You've got a car wash guy full time. I think yeah. like two car wash guys yeah. full time, right? Yeah. And uh, you have an, an admin, a really high level admin, but you have an admin and probably a couple of other people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so many, again, we talked about more leads mm -hmm. or being more efficient with the leads that you have. So I'm, I'll, I'll go and do every job that we have, I'll go do, mm. right? I, I know how to do, I've done it. And so I'll take a car to check it in and I'll go, you know what? If you do this, it'll save you five minutes. If you're saving five minutes times 20 check-ins a day, times how, you know, that's a lot of money that's For seeping sure. through the bucket. So I think anybody's role as a, a entrepreneur, you have to get good at looking at, you know, where a penny saves a penny earned, mm. you know, how can I save a penny here? Right. How can I find more customers? Like you, you, you got to multitask all mm. these things in your head, you know, yeah. and you got to be able to get good at delegating on, Hey, I want that person to be in charge of this. You've got a great, I, I don't have, there's certain things in my business. I have no skill set or mm -hmm. desire to do For none. Sure. And if I had, if I were to try, it would be a disaster. No bueno. So I've learned to stay clear of the things that I'm not good at and find people who are really good at that. Mm, I love that dude. Yeah. Well, I know we've, believe it or not, already been on here for, for well over an hour, so I'll let okay. you get out of here soon. Yeah. 
Um, what is the biggest piece of advice, like the biggest thing that you've learned? Like if you if you had a uh, a megaphone, right, and like yeah. you could, everybody in the world could hear you, yeah. right? Like what would you tell them? Like what would that thing be that you just the, the life advice, like something yeah. you've learned along the way? Yeah, I, I think if I were to look at my biggest life lesson to date, you know, I'm mm -hmm. constantly learning. I'm a big growth junkie, but if I were to look at my biggest lesson to date, and I shouldn't say it's something that I know, it's something that I'm conscious of and working on is don't beat yourself up. Mm. I, I, when things happen that are bad, like we like to beat ourselves up, right? We like to feel shame and feel guilt. And, you know, it's okay to live in that moment for a little bit because, you know, you're, somebody's teaching you something, mm -hmm. but just learn the lesson and move on, right? Mm -hmm. Don't, don't get stuck in so many people like, had that one bad thing happen to them and then that's their excuse to just give their whole life away. Mm. And so when instead, like, isn't it funny how some people have parents who are alcoholics mm -hmm. and that they'll just be total rock stars. Mm. And then there's some that will just, that's the reason why everything fell apart in their life. Mm. Right. So my biggest thing is be very careful about the meaning you attach to what's happening in your life. Right. And I love how Tony Robbins says everything is happening for you, mm. not to you. I love that. So that would be my biggest thing is, yeah. hey, hey, look, this may look like a, <laughs> your life may look like a total shit show right now. Yeah. Uh, but some may say mm. that that's a good sign of progress, mm -hmm. you know, because if you're not trying to do anything, you're not going to have anything to overcome. You're not going to mm -hmm. create any problems. Like there's going to be pr more money, more problems. We've mm -hmm. heard that, right? Mm -hmm. So that comes from when you're constantly just trying to grow and be better and excel, these things are going to happen. So have some equanimity mm. when it happens. Practice your equanimity skills. Yeah. And just a funny story, side note. I've got a good friend. Uh, you'll have to link him below. His name is Jeff Spire. I'll link it's, him. It's uh, at Jeff Spire. He is going for a world record right now. He's 20 days into it. Mm -hmm. He is doing an ultra marathon every day for 250 days from Oregon to the East Coast. Mm. And he is one of the coolest guys I've ever met. He's so strong-willed. And he stayed with me for a week and I, we're, we're in the car, we're going to the gym and there's a little dead spot by my house where there's no service. And he looks at his phone and he is freaking out and he is cussing and he is like yeah. going off at his phone. And I just looked at him and I just started laughing. Yeah. And he looked at me and he immediately like lost that and started laughing too. So I'm like, look, don't take things so seriously. Mm -hmm. Like everything is gonna be okay. The problems that we think are really big right now chances are we won't even remember later. Mm. So just take the lesson, right? It's not an L if you take the lesson from it, mm. right? I love that, dude. Yeah. Phenomenal advice. I, I resonate a ton with that too. Yeah, cool. So I'm notoriously bad at beating myself up, you know, unfortunately. You, yeah. yeah. But I got to get better at it, man, because I really do resonate with that. Like you got to give yourself grace Yeah. and like move on, you know? Um, it's hard to do. Yeah. It's hard to do. That's a great word for it, grace. Grace. Yeah. You have to. I love that word. Yeah, I do too, man. And I love what you said a minute ago, just in conclusion, um, you were talking about like the guy, like the, the parent being an alcoholic or whatever, right? Like I, there's like an old quote that's like, there's like the dad's like an alcoholic, right? And there's two kids, right? And they're both, both their dad is an alcoholic, right? They're, they're twins, okay? One twin goes off, he's super successful. He freaking just, he, he doesn't drink at all, right? Like he murders the game of life. You know what I mean? He just absolutely crushes the game of life, right? The other kid, right? They both have the same dad. The other kid becomes an alcoholic, right? Goes down the dark path, like just goes nowhere in life, right? Somebody comes along, they ask, they interview both of them, right? They ask the first one. They say, hey, like, how did you become so successful? You don't drink, like you did all these things, your dad's, you know, whatever, right? And he's like, yeah, I did all that because my dad was an alcoholic. And then they ask the second kid the same thing, you know, how to, why are you an alcoholic, blah, blah, blah because my dad was an alcoholic. Same, same dad, right? Same thing what you said a little while ago, but, but they both. Yeah. It's a prime example of you're not powerless, mm. right? You're not victim mm -hmm. of your situation. Like you get to make your environment your victim, mm -hmm. right? In a good or bad way, right? The victim is always thrown around as a bad thing, but it, we can be victims of success. For sure. Right? So it's just a matter of choice. You brought up Landmark. Yeah. I went to Landmark. It was so good. I've actually sent a ton of people. Most days going in two weeks. It's so good. I booked it for her. So hopefully she doesn't listen to this before, yeah. but the spoiler alert at the end, I remember him saying, okay, 
we're about ready to be done, which is like, you remember, it's like 15 yeah. hours a day, right? Yeah. For three days in a row. And he said, your life is empty and meaningless. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. he just sat there and he stared at us for a little bit and then he closed his book and he walked away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we all kind of sit there and we're like, what, what? But it's so true. Like one person put a meaning of that that's totally different than the other. Mm -hmm. So why not create a meaning that serves us, mm -hmm. right? So if something bad is happening to you right now, what's what's that country song? Sure. One of God's greatest gifts is unanswered prayers. Yeah. All right. Well, sure. there's there's a gift in it. Yeah. You just have to look. Man, I love that. Yeah. God, I love that. Yeah. yeah. Wow, phenomenal, phenomenal podcast, dude. We we'll definitely have to do another one. Um, you know, for anybody watching and listening, a couple things. Uh, number one, me and Brandon did a tour of his operation. Uh, it's a different YouTube video on a different YouTube channel than what you're watching right now. We'll link it down below. I'll also put it in the top of the screen. So somewhere right up here or right up here, you'll see that. Go click on that. Watch that. We actually tour your operation. Really cool video. Um, second thing. Uh, Brandon in the near future might be doing uh, some coaching and education around Turo. Um, we'll see where that goes, but that yeah. is a, a thing that will most likely happen. Yeah. Uh, one way or the other. Right. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, definitely go check out Brandon and just follow Brandon's journey. Uh, because in the coming months, you know, one way or the other, I think that he'll be probably coaching people. Um, so I'll link all of your information down below as well, but why don't you let everybody know also where they can find you? Yeah, my, uh, I really only go on Instagram. My, uh, Instagram is at Brandon Bartron, Bartron, B-A-R-T-R-O-N. And our Turo company is at you can rent me all spelled out. Phenomenal domain, by the way. Yeah. How'd you get that domain? You know what? I have fun sometimes. Where <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you have a lot. We have more business than I do. But going on to GoDaddy yeah, yeah. and just finding all these fun things, yeah. and I'm like, rent it, rent, rent a cool car, you, and you can rent me. It was there. Yeah, so I love we it. We got it. Yeah. yeah, I've got a bunch that I've never even used just because I do. I do, I do too, that yeah. too. You know, yeah. Pay for them every uh, year. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate you being on the show, man. Pleasure. Uh, yeah, means the world to me, yeah. and uh, we'll do it again in the future. Love it. Look yeah. forward to it. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, if you're still watching the show, do me a huge favor. If you're watching on YouTube, just drop a comment down below. Let me know what you liked, what you didn't like. Uh, smash that like button if you can. Subscribe if you haven't already to the show. Definitely go check Brandon out. And if you're listening on any platform, it would mean the world if you would leave a five-star review. Thank you so much, and we'll see you in the next one.